for another scary tale. Oh yeah, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> so am I. Um, we do have another really scary story for you tonight. We've got one that was first given to us by Leon Overbay about six years ago. Leon and his twin brother Lynn, they loved Halloween. They would do their best to scare their mother, scare their teachers, scare anyone and everyone they could by playing tricks or telling stories. We're all used to scary stories about what might happen if you brought someone back from the dead with tales like Frankenstein and the Mummy. But I got to thinking about that and I got scared for a whole other reason. What if we couldn't bring people back? What if we got to the point with all of our technology that we don't have to talk to each other anymore? We don't take the time to spend telling the old stories we know about our grandparents. You know, a long time ago, my daddy told me that we each die twice. Once when we leave our physical form, and then when the last person who knows the last story about us also passes away. Then he told me a story about my granddaddy, and my grandmother, and my great uncle, when he was done, I felt strong, like I came from the strongest family in the world. Leon Overbay was part of our Yarn Exchange family. Every few months or so, we continued to tell his stories, which were so wonderful and so dear to us, and in this way, we keep Leon and his memories alive, especially at this time of year, which he loved so much. Leon, we love you. Leon's favorite and most terrifying tales is actually right here, right here from Johnson City. Took place near where his grandmother worked at the Parks and Bell. It's the story of the Wumpus Cat of Johnson City. I worked in a store in downtown Johnson City in the late 60s when the town was still bustling before malls and shopping centers. It was late when I took the night deposit to the bank at the corner of Roan and Main. And after I put the money in the night deposit, I was ready to go home. But I always paused and looked up and down Main to see if I could see it. Or perhaps to make sure it wasn't there. It hadn't been seen for a while. I was looking for the wampus cat. Sightings were documented in police files. A cat-like creature, five and a half feet tall, walking on its fours till it got to a storefront and then standing on its hind legs and looking in, mostly at the mannequins dressed for a fancy ball. The creature's eyes reflected back from the storefronts like lasers, piercing, daunting, eerie, and scary. And then the creature would walk on its hind legs, disappearing into the shadow. I heard later of the events that caused this creature to exist, and it didn't happen far from here. It started simple enough at the Oak Hill School at the turn of the century, not this century, the last one, and where the Oak Hill School used to stand, not where it sits today in Jonesboro. The story goes that June and Jane were finishing their education. Eight years is plenty of school. It's time to start a family. I agree. We're soon to be 15. We don't want to become old maids. <laughs> that would be awful to end up like Llewellyn. She stayed in school through the 11th grade, and now she's 19 and still not married. Poor old thing. <laughs> when we get married, June, promise me that we'll live next to each other no matter what. Yes, and you must promise the same thing. They would surely maintain their friendship throughout their lifetimes. June's grandmother came from the Cherokee Nation and was employed by the textile mills in Kingsport. June's grandmother worked with her. This was a friendship of generations. If we have girls, they'll grow up to be best friends and sew together just like us. If we have boys, then they'll work together and hunt together and be best friends. But if one had a girl and one a boy, they agreed that would be the best scenario by far. Oh, they'll grow up together, fall in love, and get married, and then we'll have grandchildren together. Oh, Jane, wouldn't that be wonderful? 
It didn't take but a few years out of school, and they both were married, and both had a child. First, Jane had a son named Jesse, and then June had a daughter named Catherine. The matchmaking began. The two young women made sure their children spent lots of time together. They thought they'd blown their plans when for years their children fought like cats and dogs, or more like brother and sister. But then it happened. An argument caused them to stare in each other's eyes with contempt at first, but then they saw in each other's hearts and realized they were in love. Nothing could separate them. And in a short time, the families cut out a parcel of land and built them a cabin, and the wedding was planned. I took Catherine shopping for a dress. We walked up and down Main Street in Johnson City, looking in the windows at the beautiful dresses for one suitable for her wedding. There was no need to buy a dress, though. Catherine saw the one she wanted. I estimated the amount of fabric it would take to make it. Then we went to Parks and Belk and bought cloth. We went home and cut a pattern out of the newspapers. It was a beautiful dress for her wedding. No one could be happier. Till one day when Jesse was supposed to go hunting with two of his friends. Something came up and the two friends had to wait a day, so Jesse went ahead to the Cherokee Mountains to set up camp and wait for them. <coughs> Cherokee legend told of the Ewa, a huge, hairy monster that came and went. Jesse had never been afraid to go off by himself, and he wasn't about to let a legend ruin a good hunt. Jesse must have set up camp before anything happened. Provisions were stored. But when his hunting companions came upon the camp, his horse had been eaten at the fire, and Jesse was nowhere to be found. They knew it was the Ewa. There were signs of the monster leaving the camp. And then they found Jesse's tracks and followed them to a cave. They coaxed Jesse out of the cave, and when he came out, his hair had turned white, and he couldn't speak. There was a blank stare on his face. <coughs> The Ewa had scared him near to death. They took him back to Catherine. I called the doctor while Catherine sat by his side. The doctor came, but Jesse couldn't communicate. He just sat there and stared off into space, and he had no appetite. They gave him herbs and poultices, and, but nothing could bring him back. Catherine watched over him for nearly a year until he died. All of our hearts were broken. Jesse's death shook the families to the core, but it did something more to Catherine. She grieved in a way no one had ever seen. She made up her mind to exact revenge on the creature that had stolen her husband at any cost. She knew this was possible. My mother, Catherine's grandmother, had come from the Cherokee tribe in North Carolina and told her of the power of the medicine woman in the tribe that she could cast spells. Catherine went to the Cherokee village and sought out the medicine woman. I understand. If you want to do this, you must spend the season with me, learning. But you must know it would be better to go back and live your life and forget revenge. Catherine would have none of it and assisted the medicine woman. She spent weeks making a mask from the head of a mountain lion. She then gave it emerald eyes out of the stones from her native land. She conjured up a powder to treat the mask to bring to life a creature to conquer the Ewa. And finally, the medicine woman told Catherine, I'll ask you one more time. It would be far better for you to walk away now than to take on this task. I beg you to walk away. But Catherine took the mask. We knew nothing about it. She came back to our family telling us she had a journey to make before she could have peace. If I truly knew what she was doing, I would never have let her go. It was the last time I ever saw her as I remembered her. Catherine took the wampus mask and headed toward the last camp of her departed husband. She put on the mask and discovered that through the emerald eye she could see in the dark like the forest creatures. And as she walked, she felt her fingers turn into claws. She felt her teeth turn into fangs. 
She felt her body turn to solid muscle, and she felt her skin turn into the hide of a lion. She arrived at the campsite and sat where Jesse must have sat when the monster overtook him. And with hearing afforded that of a creature of the night, she heard the monster approach. She bowed her head so it couldn't see her eyes. She could feel, hear, smell, sense the monster coming nearer and nearer. And when it was within her range, she leapt into it, fighting with her teeth and claws. She was tearing flesh and burning through its eyes with her piercing gaze. The Ewa knocked her back and turned to run, and she was on its back immediately and overpowered the monster. And she went back to camp and lay down to rest. She slept sounder than she had in a year. And when she woke, she began her walk back toward home. She stopped at a pool and peered into the water to see her reflection, a hideous cat-like appearance. She tried to remove the mask, but it wouldn't come off. She pulled at her hide, but it couldn't be removed. She ran on all fours towards home, and she saw her father in the field, but when he saw her, he ran back to his house and pointed a rifle out the window. For weeks, she lurked around the farm of her parents and her friends, and she crept close enough to hear the conversations about how the Ewa took Jesse, and now must have taken Catherine. She couldn't bear the pain of seeing her family suffer her loss, so she retreated back to the Cherokee forest. It's believed that for a time in the late evenings at night in Johnson City, Catherine, the wampus cat, returned to window shop for dresses that she could make. If only she hadn't sought revenge for her beloved Jessie. And then, after several years, the creature was no longer spotted. Perhaps she went back to the mountains and died. Or she may still walk the streets, window shopping in the dark of night. Look closely when you leave tonight. Did something move in the shadows? your cars tonight, make sure to keep your eyes open. Phew, thank goodness that's all the time we have left for creepy and scary.